Would you turn to the book of Revelation 21, and I'll give the word. Revelation chapter 21. You know, there's a special blessing on Revelation. That's a book unique to all the other books. I think you'll be blessed for reading any book of the Bible, of course. Obviously, the Bible is the word of God. But God did put a special blessing in Revelation. Blessed are those that read this uh, vision. Blessed are those who hear the words of this. Blessed are those who keep the words written therein. And I've often pondered why uh, this special blessing is there. And I do have a couple of ideas about it. Number one, I think Revelation is very, very specially blessed because it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is showing us who Jesus Christ is now, not back in the days of his flesh, but now, what's he, who is he? In his glorified form, Jesus Christ is ever living to make intercession for us. He's a king and a priest in heaven. And I think another reason why Revelation is so blessed, because I don't, I, I don't think any other book of the Bible comes anywhere near uh, stripping away the veneer of the world like Revelation. I mean, the Revelation shows you the world for what it is, you know. You got this glorious shopping mall in Revelation 18 where you can buy every single product you can imagine, including the souls of men. What a picture of our world right now, where slavery is at an all-time high. Slavery, yes. Child trafficking is slavery. And it looks so shiny and good. You could buy anything and everything, starting with gold, silver, and he goes down through a shopping list of all the fine luxuries of life. And then at the bottom of the list, the thing they value the least, people. But then he strips away the veneer, and he shows us, this is Babylon, the great, the haunt of every unclean spirit and evil bird. And all of a sudden you see it for what it is and all that is falsely valued. The fate of everything falsely valued. Babylon has fallen, is fallen, is fallen. No wonder there's a great blessing on Revelation. We need to see this because never has the world presented itself so shiny and chrome covered. Then the last reason I will give, although I'm sure there are many others, what makes Revelation so blessed is bit like no other book in the Bible. The revelation takes us to heaven and shows us heaven, which I think is a very, very serious and important thing. You know, the, the cynical and the worldly mock heaven. The pie in the sky, they say. Or they have conventional wisdom, which isn't really wisdom. Truisms that are false, like he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. There is never a stupider saying than that when history proves it, that the only people that ever did any earthly good were the heavenly minded. The only people that ever did any good in this earth that was lasting were the heavenly minded. In Revelation, right at the beginning, I mean, four and five, we did this earlier. He takes you right into the throne room of God. You need to go there. You need to get a better perspective than the ground level perspective, right? All looks bleak on the ground. All looks terrible. Day after day, week after week, the advances of leftism, the advances and disintegration of a once Judeo-Christian civilization, the corruption of the culture, perversion celebrated, treachery celebrated, like in the NFL, just, just constant disintegration. And it could almost bring you down yourself and make you so cynical you, you could just give up, which many people are doing, literally. This is a demoralization campaign. What's God's solution? Well, in Revelation 4, he says, come up here, and you go right into heaven. You see the throne. It just kind of, kind of gives you a brand new perspective, right? You come back down like, yes, okay, great. Everything you see disintegrating is temporary. Now, Revelation 20 is the climax I won't say it's the end. It's the end of the beginning. Let's put it that way. It's the end of the beginning. It's a beginning of something so fantastic. You know, as long as you live on this life, which I remember when I was a kid, I thought 70 years, could anyone live for 70 years? 70 is the new 40 to me now, all right. <laughs> this life is nothing 
compared to what's being prepared for us. This life is a vapor. And this life is only a preparation. That's another thing. This life is not ultimate. It's only a preparation. We're being prepared for the next life. That's why, you know, if all you have is this life, then if you have, you know, turn downs, which everyone does, disappointments, pitfalls, then it's like the worst tragedy of all. All he has is one life and he blew it. Wait a minute, though. <laughs> this isn't all we have. We're being prepared for something better. In fact, I keep thinking of a beautiful scripture in Romans that says, the sufferings of this present life aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory that is about ready to be revealed. Or another way that I put it, and I think this is a good one for evangelism. If you're Christian, this life is as bad as it'll ever get. It's as close to hell as you'll ever get. Someone says, I'm going through hell. Well, you may feel like it, but you're not really going through hell. You have no idea what hell's like. And may God keep you from ever having any inkling of what hell's like. Though you could see hell at work on this earth, but no, you're not going through hell. But it could be bad. There's a lot of bad circumstances people are in. But that's as bad as it gets if you're a Christian. Now, if you're a sinner, on the other hand, <laughs> it's just as good as it'll ever get. I remember when I was in high school, the people would tell me, enjoy these years, son. These are the best years of your life. And I thought, are you kidding me? <laughs> they were the most miserable years. Hated school. Anyway. Let's listen to these sacred words. and Let me just make a few comments. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Let me just stop right here. See, look, the Bible says, and I know that you're familiar with this verse. Very, most Christians are. Most evangelicals love this verse, and I don't blame them. If any man be in Christ, what? He's a new creation. That's right. The old has passed away, and new has come. But you know what it literally says? If any man be in Christ, behold a new creation. What do I mean by that? Look, what he's saying is when you're born again, it's not just you that becomes new. You're part of a big project. The truth is, as it says in Revelation, God says, behold, I make everything new. I make everything new. That's the climax. Behold, I make all things new. And there's so many new things in Revelation. Like in Revelation 2, he says, look, if you be faithful, I'll give you a new name. What would, it, what, what, what would I do with a new name? Well, no, it's not a new title or tag. A new name is a new nature. Would anyone here use a new nature? I know I'm sick of the old one. I'll give you a new name. Every last bit of sin will just drain out of you. You get, uh, you get made spiritually and morally new, like it says in 2 Corinthians 5. Eventually we're going to get physically new. I told a brother, badly palsied, he's a lovely brother, he's very much part of this church. The problem is he's never been able to come because by the time he came around, he's too sick to come. His name's Lanny. I say, Lanny, you're going to get a new body. This is good news. You're going to get a new body. Because he's in such pain now. And he told us, I don't want to be healed in this life. He says, if God did it, I, I wouldn't find it, fight it. But I don't want to be healed. I'm just glad I'm saved. Sounds like a real convert, doesn't he? Hallelujah. You're going to get a new body? We get to sing a new song? Amen. Sing unto the Lord a new song. You're going to get a new Jerusalem. You know what the, the name Jerusalem means? The city of peace. You know what's ironic? If you look at the history of Jerusalem, you've never seen a less peaceful city. It's the most conflict-ridden city the world has ever seen. The city of peace. Well, there's a new Jerusalem being constructed. Coming out of heaven. Of course, you'd expect it. If it's the most important city on this strife-ridden earth, of course it's going to be the most strifeful city. But there is a new Jerusalem coming down. And there's a new earth coming. And a new heaven. But I like what Peter says. The heavens and the earth are going to melt away with a fervent heat. God is going to purify this place by fire. 
You get a new relationship with God. It says in heaven, there's no temple. Why? Because there's no distance whatsoever for anybody. There's no outer court, inner court, holy of holies. The whole world will be a holy of holies. We'll be with God. All will know the Lord. Amen, Brother Ron? A new vision of God. John tells us, it doesn't yet appear what we shall be. I'm quoting 1 John 3. But when we see him, we'll be like him. For then we'll see him as he is. You know what that's called? The beatific vision. It's the real goal to see him. Because to see him is to transform you into being like him. The real goal is seeing Jesus. We don't know. Peter says, we've never seen him yet. But we love him. And we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, don't we? But John says, yes, but the goal is you will see him. And when you look in his face, when you get a new vision of God, all the ache and pain and poison of this world that you carry about so much, you're used to it now. You don't even feel it, although it's there. It weighs you down in a thousand ways. It all drains out. To see him is to be like him. There's a new name, a new song, a new heaven and earth, a new Jerusalem. There's actually a new age coming, the age of righteousness. In the ancient world, they saw two ages, and they were right. The, this age and the age to come, the overlap. Okay, the overlap. The age to come has been coming. This age is passing away. This age is an age of death and decay. It's the age of death. Satan is the god of this age. There is one good thing about this age. You can be saved in it. You can be saved in it. The gospel gives this age a brand new flavor. You can be saved if you do it while you got the time. You must get saved. Because this age is already passing away. And so are all those who are of this age. So like the, the, the Bible talks over and over again about the great people of the earth, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the experts, the pundits, the power people, the beautiful people, all people of this age, all passing before your eyes into oblivion. Well, even worse than oblivion, judgment, death. All who value them, all who worship them, all who emulate them, they're going that way too. The age to come is the age of Jesus. All who love Jesus. The problem with us is this is not our age. We're in the, we're in the age to come. As, as Paul says in the Hebrews, that the church has the power of the age to come. We're like a for, uh, forerunner. Uh, we're, we're a little bit of a, a, a vanguard of the coming age. In the coming age, there'll be peace and righteousness. Well, in the church of the living God, there's peace and righteousness. In the coming age, there'll be reconciliation to God. Well, we have that. In the coming age, there'll be powers. The trees will be for the healing of the nations. Well, you can, you're liable to go to church and be healed too. Because we have the powers of the age to come. But this isn't our age. You know, even creation is longing for a new age. I'm going to quote Romans here. I'm way off script, all right, but just bear with me. Romans 8 says that all creation is groaning together. Do you know that? Even the earth is morally sensitive. You know why we have these earthquakes? You know why we have these floods? You know why we have all this increased activity coming closer and closer and closer together? Now, don't tell me it's a two-stroke engine, all right? Paul said, look... As you get closer to the end, the earth begins to wear out. And he makes the earth, uh, he proclaims that it's morally sensitive, that the earth groans wanting to be redeemed from the curse that came upon it. And then he even tells us, why, why is this pre present age the age of death and decay? God put a curse of vanity on this earth. Everything breaks down, laws of entropy. 
Everything decays. Everything goes from order to disorder in this earth. Why? Ever since the fall, God did that. Now, why did he put that principle in this earth? If he wouldn't have put that principle in this earth, we would never long for the other age. We would only live for this age. If you never got old, if you never got weak, if you never lost your good looks and your masculine or feminine form, if you would, could continue just at prime for all your life, if you lived to 900 years old, your evil would be compounded year after year after year. You would never turn to God. Ever. You know how I can say that authoritatively? It's been tried. As in the days of Noah. Those people were healthier than you could fathom. Those people were preserved. Those people lived in a greenhouse. Those people didn't eat Twinkies, okay? They're fantastic. 900 years, okay? And you know what? That is the most evil generation there has ever been other than the last one. The last one will be just as bad. That's what Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So the first thing he proclaims is everything's going to be new. But he says there'll be no more sea. Now, um, I never saw the ocean until I was 30 years old. When I saw the ocean, Chris is my witness, I wept and took my breath away because I'd never seen such beauty and such power. What do you mean there's no, no more sea? Well, the Bible and the book of Revelation especially is apocalyptic, and it speaks in apocalyptic terms, and many of these terms are symbolic. See, basically, it's, it, like it says in the Psalms, on account of the creation, says that he made, he made the sea, but it was so unruly, it was so powerful, he drew a line and said, you could come this far, but no farther. And that's the coastlines, all right? In other words, the sea is a representative of the unruly, out of control, dark, powerful human history, much of it driven by demonic powers. The sea, the powers of evil, the powers of chaos, the powers that reverse all order. Now we're seeing this, look at Houston, okay? It's a perfect metaphor for that. So there's not gonna, we're not gonna have that problem in the age to come. I, don't, I know there'll be an ocean. John saw in another vision, I saw before the throne, a sea of glass. It's chaos, it's darkness. Like it says three times in the prophet Isaiah, the wicked are like the raging of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. There is no peace, saith my God, for the wicked. And Psalm says, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. <laughs> they lift up their voice <clears throat> more than the sound of many waters. And then Psalm 2. Why did the heathen rage? Jesus said the oceans raging, Luke 21, and men's hearts failing for fear of the things coming on the earth. But here in Revelation, it's not the end, remember, it's the beginning. It's the end of the beginning. <laughs> no more of that chaos. No more of the wicked foaming up their shame, like Jude says. No more of the floods of angry, rebellious men lifting up their voice against the Lord, the Most High. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Well, Revelation has a special uh, connection to Genesis. And one of the things Genesis tells you in its early chapters, as I point out in my book, I'm not trying to hawk my book, but it's out there for $9.95. Anyway, <laughs> of all the things he tells us essential to humanity in the first 11 chapters, only what's essential, this is the creator, this is what he thinks is essential, he's going to tell us the origin of the city. Why is there a city? And the origin of the city is because he condemned man to, a man that was a murderer to wander. And the man in his rebellion refused to wander. He, he's not going to wander, even though he's sentenced to wander. So he, on his own, built a city with his, with his family and called the city 
new start. A new start without God. Now, how many people have heard the old this, the oldest story of the book? Country kid leaves the farm and goes to the city for a new start. Nobody knows him there. He turns his back on everything. Even Jesus told a story like that, didn't he? Brand new start, brand new morals, brand new friends, brand new experiences. Turn your back on everything. See, the city is a special place for the concentration of evil. The Bible says Cain built a city after he killed his brother and refused accountability. Now God said, you'll be a wanderer. Cain said, no, I won't. I'll, be, I'll build a city. But that might explain the restlessness of city life. You will be a wanderer. You will be restless. Now, the word that God said in Genesis, that Cain built a city, had already been used once earlier. When it says that God took Adam's side out, he used the same word, and built Eve. He built his bride. So Cain builds a city in defiance of God, but God preempts him. He builds a bride, a bride. And therefore, in biblical thought, there's basically, there are many cities, of course, but there's two primal symbolic cities, Jerusalem and Babylon. Okay. Babylon is the city of man and represents uh, self-love, pride, independence from God. Okay, and, uh, you know, included in this idea from Genesis is the use of technology, use of uh, breakthroughs in animal husbandry, the arts, all designed to start a new life without God. That is the city of man, and the city of man is at its apex right now. But God has been building a city all along, too. The new Jerusalem, praise the Lord. And if the main, uh, the main uh, theme of the city of man is self-love, to thine own self be true, do what thou wilt, right? That's the city of man. The city of God is the love, is, is the love of God, love, loving God, denying even to the point of saying no to self. All who are composed of the city of God. Okay. Now, so the city, the city comes down from heaven. The origin is heaven. Coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So as God presented Eve to Adam, in the end he will present the bride of Christ to Jesus. The holy city, the refuge of the seed of the woman. All who truly trust in God and turn their back on this world, they get to be part of that city. I mean, you see this theme all through the Bible. The city of man versus the city of God. And he says, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He'll dwell with them. They'll be his people. And God himself shall be with them. And he'll be their God. Well, this is the long-awaited goal. Ever since the garden. Remember when they sinned, they got kicked out? And when they got kicked out, he sent burning angels that are terrifying creatures with burning swords to keep them out of the garden, to guard them from the garden. These angels are cherubim, and uh, they're fierce and burning. And there was always this separation. Man could not go to God anymore. Man could not be with God. And then later when he uh, built the tent of the tabernacle, woven into the curtain that kept man from God were these same cherubim. Man cannot go to God. Man cannot be with God. It would kill man anyway, because man is unholy, unfit, rendered unfit to even have communion with God. Only a distant, only a vicarious through priests, mediators, sacrifices. Even in the temple of Solomon, on the very holy curtains that separated people from God, were woven these cherubim in the garden. (laughs) But thank you, God. This is one of the underappreciated facts of the crucifixion. That when Jesus died for our sins, 
that temple with those cherubim was ripped in two, and the door was open, signifying now it's possible for man to come to God. Sinful man can actually be with God. Well, in the world to come, there won't even be a temple or a church. God is just going to live with us, and we'll be able to live with him. And he'll be our God, and we'll be his people. And verse 4 might be one of the most powerful verses of all. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. What? Who have you ever let wipe tears from your eyes? How close do you have to be to that person that they can actually dab the tears away from your eyes? Not everybody can wipe tears from your eyes, can they? Only the closest people possible. And that is perhaps one of the most loving things that a mother or father would do or a husband or wife, to wipe the tears. We are given a promise that God himself is going to wipe our tears from our eyes. And verse 4 tells me something else too, something I pointed out before. I just want you to see this. There will be no more death, neither will there be sorrow, nor crying, nor will there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Notice that it's all negative. Everything in that verse is negative. What is he saying? What's coming is so wonderful that we don't even know how to put it into words. It can only be described negatively. So he says, what's it going to be like? Oh, no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more betrayal, no more disappointment, no more fear or terror. Everything negative. Whereas we have such a negative existence, we don't even realize how negative it is. It's so negative that heaven is indescribable to us. We cannot describe it positively, not very much at all, because it's so foreign to our existence, we have no idea what's right there beyond the veil for us. One thing I've been t- I want to tell you, finish strong. Run this race, because like Ken said, the sun's going down. We got to finish strong. We're not just going to hang on. We want to go into the everlasting kingdom abundantly. He promised us a kingdom, didn't he? And he promised each of us a role in that kingdom. And every single one of us, you have no idea the impact of your life. Anyway, let me go on here. He that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make everything new. That sums it up. And he said to me, right, for these words are true and faithful. And I wouldn't be a true and faithful minister of God if I didn't remind you of this. Everything's going to be made new. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Now, one thing I will have to say, I haven't seen some of this world. The beauty of, of the world in its present state is breathtaking, right? And I often wonder if this is what it's like in a ruined state. After a cataclysm just totally disrupted everything, the flood. After sin introduced thorns and mosquitoes and everything like that. What's it going to be like in its perfected state? I mean, I've seen sights in this world, like the sun going down on an ocean, where I just sat there and thought, I wish I could just melt into that. It's so beautiful. Or some autumn day here in Iowa, even with the colors, I just think, am I in heaven? It's so beautiful. Never quite enough, though. Always passes. All right? And you wish it wouldn't, but it does. But in that world to come, man, we'd have no idea. I have not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it even entered into the heart the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But see, this brings me to another point. You've got to love him. You've got to love him. See, this is the problem, and this is what scares me. A lot of people don't love God, really. They really don't. There's a difference between loving the idea of God and really loving God. God is a personal God, so he deals with us on a personal level. 
If you love God, then you're, put, you're at his disposal. You're not doing your own thing. You don't look at the world that way. Like, I'm my own master, a maker of my own faith. You are his servant. You are his slave. If you love God, you are at his service. If you love God, he's real to you. He is real. His word is the authority. He is one, the one you listen to. Like Deuteronomy tells us in one place, what it means to even have a God. He says, he is your God. By him you swear. What's that mean, by him I swear? That means that my authority is him. Not the experts, not the masters, not the PhDs. If there's any contradiction whatsoever, I go by him. That's what it means by him you swear. The word of God is truth. Amen. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. You've got to love God. And here's why we're going to have to love God. See, he goes on in this beautiful vision. He saith unto me, it is done. It's already accomplished fact. There's already a new world. There's already a new name. There's already a new heavens and a new earth. There's already a beautiful future prepared for all who love him. It is not a question of whether there is or not. It's done. Only question is, you're going to partake in it. You're going to be part of it. He says, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now here's one of the Symptoms of if you love God, if you have spiritual thirst. See, some people go, okay, another Sunday, <laughs> another sermon, Pastor Bill. Brother Ken's going to give his mission account. Blah, blah, blah. Another worship service, same old songs. Look, if that's your soul, that's scary. Something's wrong with you. You're deader than you know. You really are deader than you know. Because every time we come together, where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus is right here. He's real. And when you actually love him, you're like, I, I wonder what he's going to say to me. I need him to do something in me. I got burdens. I got problems. Everyone here has got problems. I got problems. I'm taking to him. Stuff I can't deal with. I can't see right. I need him. See, this is the meaning of spiritual thirst. Besides that, thirst is a great metaphor for the unsatisfying nature of this world. You, Jesus is on the cross. He says, I thirst. They give him vinegar. How would you like that? Spiritual thirst is a blessing even though it can be a burden. You know why it's a burden? I was burdened with the spiritual thirst even before I was born again because I was always haunted by this feeling that there's something higher and purer than anything that this world has to offer me that I want. I want it. With spiritual birth, it, it, birth uh, thirst is a blessing if, if it causes you to move up higher to seek God. If anyone's thirsty, notice he says at the end of the Bible, he looks up from the pages, looks right into your soul. Are you thirsty? If you are, you come to me. I'm telling you something. Coming to Jesus slakes my thirst. It's, he's, he's what I'm looking for in heaven where he's going to take me. That's what I want. And he goes on to say, he that overcomes. Oh, see, here's the problem. I uh, talk about you got to love God. Well, well, one of the things that I don't think this generation understands properly, well, much of it is because of false prophets. Beware of false prophets. Not everyone that calls themselves a prophet, uh, if they don't, just because they don't call themselves a prophet doesn't mean they're not a false prophet. Anyone who stands up in the name of the Lord and tells you something like this. It's all grace. It's totally grace. And God loves you no matter what. If you've ever been saved, you're always saved. And you don't have to worry about uh, maintaining your salvation. 
That is a false prophet by definition because false prophets make sinners comfortable in their rebellion and sin. They make them feel all right about not really loving God. They give them peace and assurance where there is no peace more, more merited. And, he's, and, and look what he says in verse 7 in the last verse, verse of the book of the Bible, which is also the book that has a special blessing. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. And I'll be his God, and he will be my son. See, we have to overcome. I kind of knew this at the beginning, that I received the gospel. And then you've got to walk it out, and you will be presented with many, many problems and temptations. Like it says in the song, through many dangerous toils and snares, I have already come. Grace has brought me safe thus far. Grace will lead me home. Now, first of all, I want to say, it is all grace. Here's the, here's the breakdown. It is all grace. It is grace. But what's the meaning of grace? See, here's, here's this generation says, the meaning of grace is this and this alone. Grace means God will forgive you even though you don't deserve it. And I agree with that. But grace must mean something more. Otherwise, the book of Titus wouldn't say, the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching them to say no to ungodly lusts. But what is grace? Well, it is forgiveness. And it's power to live a godly life, or power that impels you to at least take up the battle, that you're just not going to be satisfied, just, all right, I prayed the prayer, I'm going to heaven. No. Well, you overcome, to him that overcomes. Look, look what he says, to him that overcomes. Overcomes what? <laughs> then he gives a list. You've got to overcome the beast. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. I'll be his God, he'll be my son. But the fearful, see, some people have to overcome fear. They're more afraid of what man thinks than what God thinks. Therefore, they won't witness to people. Of course not. It's uncool. They want to make a good impression on people. And by the way, let me talk about fear for a minute. Jesus said, don't fear him that can... Uh, kill the body. After, her, after that, he has no more he can do. Fear him that has power to cast body and soul in hell. Look, fear doesn't just mean craven fear like you're afraid something bad's going to happen to you. Fear also means regard. Someone says, I, I have such regard for this sinner. I would never confess Christ to him. They'd think I'm a nerd. Look, you have not overcome. Look what he says, the fearful are outside the city. People, that, they're, they're more afraid of man. They have higher regard for man than God. They bow the knee to man every time. When it comes down between God and man, even if they confess to be a Christian, when it comes down between God and man, they'll go with man every time. No concept that you're supposed to fear God above all and not man. The fearful... He says, you got to overcome that fear. The unbelieving, you got to overcome unbelief. I could do a whole thing on this. Unbelief, what is it? It doesn't mean doubt. It means refusal. Saying no to God is unbelief. Not letting God make you content. Not letting God give you faith. Not letting God be your Lord. That's unbelief. You've got to overcome that. He doesn't say automatically, you prayed the prayer, you're going to be in the city. Outside the city, the fearful, the unbelieving. Let me move on. The abominable. I mean, this is really crazy. Uh, we're living in a day now where Christians are trying to baptize homosexuals as Christians. 
Now, why, is, why we got this dilemma? Well, pastors are fearing man. They don't want to be accused of being hate mongers. So they fear man more than God. And now they're baptizing uh, sexual perverts and saying, you're born again, even if you are sexually perverted. And Jesus loves and understands you. He says, outside the city are the abominable. I'm not the one that said homosexuality is an abomination. God is. You shall not lie with a man as with a man. It is an abomination to the Lord. I didn't come up with that. It just so happens I'm not ashamed of it either. There is an order that God ordained. You can't rebel against it and be in the holy city. You've got to go with the order. It's basic, isn't it? Not anymore. None of these insane days. Please, God, let us keep our heads. Outside of the abominable, he says. And murderers. Man, we are just flowing with murderers in this modern society. There have been 60 million abortions since Roe versus Wade. Who are the murderers? Well, a lot of young women are murderers. A lot of old women are murderers. A lot of mothers who, who demanded abortion are murderers. A lot of boyfriends who demanded abortion are murderers. I don't know if there's that many people with clean hands in this country anymore. The murderers are people that defiantly fight and vote for abortion are murderers. That would make the whole Democratic Party murderers. And a good share of the Republicans. Because if they could, they'd ditch that. Outside the city are murderers. Not in it. And he goes on to say, See, this is, this is what he's telling you we have to overcome. See, you can overcome the fear of man. You can see it for what it is, and you can make up your mind once and for all, who you going to fear, man or God? Make up your mind prayerfully. Ask God for help and power. And figure out which way you're going to go. Ask for me, I want in that city. I don't want to be out of it. I want in it. You see what I'm saying? You can overcome your fear. I overcame a false prophecy. I used to follow a false prophet, uh, Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin. And when I saw that they were false, see, it wasn't, I don't think it's a sin to be misguided. What's a sin is once you see it, what do you do? Where's your loyalty lie? That's the test. Are you going to be loyal to that person or people like them, or are you going to be loyal to the Word of God? Amen. Listen, everyone, don't be loyal to me. Be loyal to the Word of God. If I ever start teaching false doctrine, get out of here. Your getting out of here might help me. I might say, wait, those are good people. Why are they leaving? Well, the first thing I'd do is think about what am I teaching? Okay. A lot of false prophets just keep on prophesying because a lot of people have misguided loyalty. They love it. They love to have it so. He says, you got to overcome the fearful, the abominable. I know homosexuals that overcame it. I know people that turned their back on it. Now, now here, here's the horror story, okay, is that back when society was sane, can you believe it or not? I mean, even, even, even when we were starting to crumble, and there was a little period, because of pornography, I believe, that people began to dabble with homosexuality. And I saw a statistic that said, most of these are temporary. And then they think it's sick, and then they get out of it. But once society changes so much that there's not that support outside of it, this is right, come back to normalcy, please. Once you destigmatize it. What you do is trap a lot of people in it, and they never come out. See, that's what Satan's doing through false prophets, false teachers, false people like Oprah, people like that. They, those are Satan's agents, making it less likely that someone would ever leave. I guarantee you, when you get to heaven, you're going to see transgender people. You're going to see homosexual people. You're going to see murderers. You're going to see pirates. You're going to see former Muslim terrorists. All former, though, up there in heaven. Uh, you know, there's a beautiful verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 6. It says that 
Uh, don't be deceived, homosexuals and, and adulterers and abusers of themselves of mankind. He goes through this sordid list. He says, None of them will see the kingdom of heaven. But then he says, but such were some of you, and you have been washed. You have been sanctified. You have been made holy in the blood of Christ and of the Lamb. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Hey, there's no good people up there. This chapter is a, a chapter about, and all the good ones are up there. All the people that did it all right, every step along the way. There's not even a hint of that. He says, man, the people got up there, went through a very sordid, pornographic world, and they overcame adultery. They overcame fornication. I feel for the young people. Fornication, there's almost no stigma to it whatsoever. And I think... You know, we, we think we're compassionate, okay? So I remember one time in the 70s at a high school graduation that a girl that got pregnant out of wedlock stood up to get her diploma, and everyone applauded her. Well, on the one hand, I don't blame you for encouraging someone. That's a rough situation to be in. But on the other hand, what kind of a message is that? So someone said, well, we don't want any shame. Well, sometimes shame's good. <laughs> I wish... People need a good dose of shame. You know what God said to Moses' sister one time? This is the biggest put down in the Old Testament. God looked at Moses' sister and said, I wish your father would have spit in your face. Then maybe you wouldn't be brought to this place of arrogance that she was at. What? Oh, that's, that's abusive. <laughs> no. License is abusive. Nothing being wrong anymore. Now that's abusive. That's insanity. Anybody here? No boundaries. Hey, everybody. No boundaries is abusive. That's abuse. Not a little old-fashioned shame. Like my mother pulled me by the ear through the neighborhood when I raided the garden. <laughs> and all my friends jeered at me. I did a lot of other bad things, but I never read in another garden. <laughs> well, let me move on here. He puts in sorcerers. The sorcery's never had a better day. So it's really sorcerers now? Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> we never had a time where there's more mind altering drugs. Legal and illegal, that people resort to to escape reality. That is what this word is right here. Pharmakia. We get our word sorcery from it. Outside the city, it's sorcerers. Never been more sorcerers. Idolaters. Oh my gosh. When you realize what idolatry really is. It's putting anything in the place of God. Some says, my mood is shot. Why? Hawks lost last night. Won't be right for a week. That's hawk idolatry. I like football too. I like favorite teams to win. But if you're going to let it affect your mood, you can't come to church the next day and praise the Lord. And think, that is worthless, meaningless compared to what we're doing here. Wow. I hope you make it in the city because you've got to overcome your idolatry. See? He says, outside the city, we're all liars. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't even need to get into that. People routinely lie now. They don't even blink an eye. Look what he says. They'll have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. But he says, overcome. Overcome. You've got to overcome. There is a struggle. And there will be many struggles. One, one song that comes to mind lately that's way deeper than a lot of people realize because it's so simple, but it's so profound. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. See that nasty list outside the cities? I mean, there's people struggling 
with some of this stuff right here. I've struggled myself. We all struggle. If anyone says they don't struggle, they're lying. I haven't arrived. I don't want to be outside that city. I want to overcome. Well, I need Jesus. Oh, what grief we often carry. Oh, what needless peace we forfeit. All because we don't carry everything to him in prayer. What a friend. He's the author and finisher of faith. He's the one that caused me to turn aside to see the burning bush. He's the one that will walk through these trials with you if you'll allow him. He's the one that will give you the power to identify and to overcome these sins that are keeping people out of the holy city. He's there every step along the way. He's the one. And if you don't think that you can, uh, uh, in closing, if you don't think, you know, someone says, I've done so, so much bad that I don't think I could ever get in there. Well, he goes on in the chapter, and I've repeated this so many times, but I'll repeat it again. He goes in the chapter, he says, on the walls of the city, over each gate, is the names inscribed of one of the children of Israel. I remember when I was a Catholic, I'd never read the Bible. I thought, I've got to find out about these children of Israel. Every one of them must have a halo. They must be awesome saints, man. That's the mindset, you know. Wow, they must be so sold out. And I read a story about a family. I don't even think Jerry Springer would feature them because they're just too crazy. A man with four, has children by four different women. Reuven steals his father's concubine, sleeps with her in a spirit of lust. Simeon and Levi have a temper problem. How bad? They trick a town into circumcision so they can kill every man in it. Judah sold his brother to Arab slave traders for 20 pieces of silver. And yet you can't pass into this holy city through those gates without going through one of those names. What in the world does that say? about this city, Brother Don. What's it say about it? That you pass under the names of people, you don't know anyone as sordid as Reuven. You never met anyone so savage that they tricked a town into circumcision and killed everyone in the town. You never met anyone like that, have you? <laughs> Judah sold his brother as a slave? <laughs> Lied to his father? <laughs> Yet you can't go into this holy city without going under one of those names. The gates are pearl. You know what a pearl is? It's the answer of a wounded life to injury. A clam gets wounded and they secretes and forms a pearl. What's the meaning of the pearl and the 12 names? That this isn't a city full of do-gooders and goody two-shoes and perfect people that had all their ducks in a row. This is a city full of ruined people, spotted, blemished, distorted, disfigured by sin, who found redemption through the blood of the Lamb and through Jesus Christ the Lord. Do you believe that? Father, minister to your people by your spirit this reality. For thinking about these things can keep us going when it seems like nothing else will. Give us a heavenly vision so that we can be doing earthly good. Amen. And we'll give you the glory and praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all.